Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's Monday night. It's two weeks since our last live stream. So here we are again with another Sonar Masterclass. Thanks to Lawrence tonight. And we've got with us Nabil Issa. Good day, Nabil. How are you going, mate? Good. Thanks, Craig. How's it going? Yeah, going really, really well. And glad to have you here today, mate, to talk about Morton Bay Jewfish, which is a topic that you know pretty well and uh, a topic that I know is going to be of interest to a lot of our viewers tonight. Um, you and I have chatted about Jewfish on the Australian Lure Fishing Podcast some time back. You absolutely rocked the microphone, mate. People love that episode. Lots of great questions came in from that, lots of great comments. And, mate, you um, you talked about massive schools of Jew in that particular episode. Today you're actually going to be able to show us some screenshots of that, which will be fantastic. So great to have you along. So. Folks, if you're a regular on the Sonar Masterclasses, you'll know what we like to do at the start is have a bit of a chat and give people the opportunity to come into the room. So as you come in, please let us know you're here. Give us your name. Tell us where you're coming in from. Let us know that you can hear us all right. So we've got a few people starting to show up. So Nick coming in from Adelaide, good on you, mate. Thank you for checking in with us. Nice to know that people can hear us. Always difficult, Nabil, when we're doing these things on the screen. We don't know if anyone can hear us. We can't see anyone. Graham's no, there as well. Thanks, guys. It's different. Um, I'm seeing the, the view count go up. It feels a bit I feel a bit nervous, like people are watching me, but I can't actually see them. Yeah, know? yeah. I oh, just don't worry about it, mate. There's no one there. <laughs> you and I having a bit of a chat. That's it. Wouldn't get to, wouldn't get I'll to just cover see. that part of the screen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that joke, no, don't get start getting stage right on me now, mate. It'll be all good. <laughs> I know I know you're going to rock it, mate. It'll be great. So loud and clear, Matt says, from Brisbane. It's a good one for you, Matt, because we're going to be talking about Morton Bay, so right on your doorstep there. Another one coming in from Adelaide. Thank you, Bruce. Bruce is a regular, been here a couple of times. Got good sound and pick. Thanks, mate, for letting us know. So, Nabil, let's have a quick chat. Dave from Cairns in my backyard. G'day, Dave. Nice to have you here. No Jew up here, or not the uh, not the southern kind that Nabil's mm. going to be talking about, but of course, we do have the black Jew up here. If you want to go out and chase those, I'm not sure how do they compare, mate. Do you, have you ever compared black Jew and the southern? No, I really want to though. Like, um, yeah, by the sounds of it, and this is just going off what I've seen, you know, on Facebook posts and videos. They seem quite easy to catch um, if you find them in in schools. And I've heard you can find them very similarly in quite large schools. Yeah. Um, obviously, they just don't release so good. Um, but definitely keen to. Oh, I'd love to go up and, and target them and use the same sort of techniques that we use, you know, here to look for them. It'd be pretty cool, I think. Yeah, it would be really, really cool. And I would love to hear the results of that, mate. So we might have to compare notes because uh, I reckon there's going to be some similarities. There's going to be some differences as well. They are different species. So, of course, they do behave a little bit differently. But, mate, Morton Bay Jew, you know, I, I lived in Brisbane for quite a long time. Never really got into the Jew in Morton Bay, but... It wasn't until you and I started chatting on the podcast a while back I realised what a fishery it is. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's um, it's a funny one because it's not something you read about from past years, you know, whereas like, you know, snapper, for example, off the Gold Coast, that's always been a thing, you know, or, um, you know, flattered at the jumping pin. You know, those are kind of like iconic things. But yeah, um, Jew and Morton Bay never really was. And... You know, I put it down to, you know, one of the main reasons is just the advances in technology, mm. you know, in the last sort of, like I've probably been around that, that sort of fishing for, what are we, maybe seven, eight years now. Mm. And, yep. you know, before that, I didn't really know Morton Bay to be a really good Jew fishery. I heard you hear of the odd one here, caught here and there. But I really think it's um, side scan that's really changed it. Mm. You think... Uh, you know, days gone by where you, you've got a sonar where you're just looking under the boat. Um, you're not really covering much ground and you're probably checking a certain spot that you know holds fish, but you wouldn't sound around too much maybe or the ground you do sound, you know, you're only covering the width of your boat, you know, a bit more than that. But now you've got a side scan and you can do a pass and you're covering, oh, what do I sound, maybe 150 foot either side of the boat. So... For everyone listening, I'll talk in feet tonight. I'll try and convert to <laughs> meters. I just, I'm just very used to my uh, sounder in feet. But um, so let's say um, up to maybe 50 meters either side of the boat. So in one mm. scan, you know, I can cover 100 meters. Uh, sorry, 300. Let's say 50 meters either side. So 100 meters of um, width. Mm. You know, and I can cover. So for anyone familiar with um, Morton Bay or 
um, fishing Brisbane that know of the Harry Atkinson Ar artificial reef or the West Peel artificial reef, they're pretty popular spots. And you can, you know, do one pass pretty quickly through the area and, and know for certain if there's fish there or not without mm. wasting much time. It's an absolute so I mean, game changer, yeah. It is. It really has changed things. Like, you, you, without trying to brag, like, I never really heard of many big numbers of Jew caught previously to having sounded um, fish and started catching them myself. And from others as well, you know, from that point on, mm. I think it's just the last, you know, five to ten years is where you really um, – have seen this jump, the surge of numbers of fish being caught in Morton Bay, you know, and, and the same for Brisbane River, the Gold Coast. Side scans really changed that. It absolutely has. And, you know, you can see fish, you can see bait, you can see structure, and you can mark it on your on your GPS as well. So you can come back around, have another another pass that you know, or we'll go through in a few passes in different directions to you know, really map it out in your mind and on the screen and yeah. figure out where to fish. Of course, you know, once you get there, once you find the fish, that's one thing. Actually catching them is another thing. So in, in some ways, the side scan can be a little bit frustrating at times when you find fish, but then you can't catch them. So, folks, uh, if you've been a regular at these sonar masterclasses, you know that we don't limit ourselves to just talking about sonar. And Nabil's pretty uh, pretty adept at nailing the old Jews on lures. I think he's done pretty well on the snapper as well. So feel free, folks, to fire through questions as we go along. Feel free, of course, to make those questions about sonar or about uh, more generally about catching dew. If that's what you need some help with, we're more than happy to help you out. So, um, Joven saying we should turn this into an extra podcast. Never get to watch the whole thing. <laughs> we'll see what we can do, mate. And Jim says he doesn't mind whether we're working in metric or imperial. So, uh, good on you, Jim. I think Nabil and I are probably of a, a similar era that um, we kind of came up, well, I came up after the metric system had come in, but a lot of people are still using the imperial system. And so I, I'm quite comfortable working between the two and I'm pretty sure you're the same, Nabil. But it's, um, it's a funny one because, I mean, I'm all, all metric. Like I grew up around metric system. Hmm. Like imperial to me sounds you're still, younger than right? me. Is that, what you, is that what you're trying to say? Oh, I didn't want you to put me in the same uh, <laughs> <laughs> category there. I just had to make that clear. Um, but, you know, in the last sort of... Um, well, I guess all I've used my sounder, I, I don't know, for whatever reason, I started with the feet, but now I just prefer it's, it's a bit more detailed. Like you think if you're in metric versus um, imperial, let's say you're in one meter of water, um, I'm in 3.2 feet potentially. You know, there's a bit more accuracy to it. Yes. And and for the depths that I fish, like I'm not fishing, I rarely fish over 100 meters of water. So if I fish for snapper, generally it's up to 50 meters. And... 150 foot, you know, fine with. Um, if I consistently fish deeper, then I probably don't need that level of accuracy and I'll probably go to the meters. Um, but I guess just being used to it over the years as well, you, you sort of get to understand feet and I know how long my lure is going to take to sink in 30 foot, but yep. not necessarily in 10 meters. You know, I have to think about <laughs> it. Um, so in my head, it works one way. Um, but, you know, I work in my line of work, I work for a builder and so everything's metric yep. in meters and millimeters. That's a bit funny that way, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Now, look, we've got some questions starting to come through already, which is great. Love that, guys. Uh, we're here to answer questions, so fire them through. So um, we've got one from Peter. We've got one from Bruce. Um, and we've got um, Ty chiming in there with a comment about the uh, – where are we? I think he means live scan units. Get yeah, they're, 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 uh, <laughs> they're – um, Coming, yeah. Wait, wait for what's on the on the horizon there. I won't say much more than that. But anyway, um, folks, we will get to those questions. So Peter's asked some questions about how to set up his side scan. Um, Bruce also uh, asking about side scan settings. But I think what we might do, folks, is get in and have a couple of look, uh, have a look at a couple of Nabil's screenshots uh, because that might be the best way to explain um, some of this uh, stuff about the side scan. So what we'll bring up first, Nabil, and I'll just shoot us off the screen down to the bottom there. What we'll bring up first is one of your structure images. So tell us about what we're looking at here and help us decipher that screen a little bit. Okay, so this would be my typical um, screen setup when I'm sounding for Jew and Morton Bay. So I've got on the top my GPS on the left, um, middle I've got my sonar, so the traditional sonar, and on the top right I've got my down scan. So down scan um, is showing us more. Um, I guess to put it simply, it's more of a photo type image of what we're looking at. Mm. Um, sonar, I guess there's a bit more interpretation involved. Um, 
So it's not, um, it's, it, gives, it gives different information, I guess. It's not as clear. It may not look as clear. And that image definitely shows it not looking as clear, but it's showing me more information. Um, and so that's why I like to have, you know, all, all the options available. And on the bottom is the main one. The thing I can't live without is my site scan. So this, this here, um, to explain what's happening, if you look on the bottom left and the bottom right, you'll see the, there's a number 120 on both sides. And that's saying that we're scanning 120 feet either side of the boat. Um, on the left-hand side is where all the action's happening. So this is the left-hand side of the boat. Um, I've got a wreck. So yeah, pretty much where your cursor is. So you sort of see the outline of a boat. There's actually two wrecks close to, to each other, a bigger one and a smaller one. Um, one thing to note with this wreck, you'll see we've got a large shadow behind the bottom wreck. And what that's telling me is that that wreck is taller. It's got more depth to it. Um, the shadow, it's um, an easy way to put it. It's like shining a torch at an object. Uh, a taller object's gonna give you a bigger shadow smaller object will give you a smaller shadow and the shadows are quite important especially for the screenshots that i'll go through a bit later as well um, shadows will help you determine where fish are in the water column and help you you know to understand where they are and help you target them a lot better so we've got we've got those two wrecks on the left we've also got so moving slightly further left let's say between 50 and 100 we've got a couple of round shapes you'll see just next to the wreck slightly up from your cursor greg um, yeah, one, two, three round little circles. I hope they're clear enough on the screen for everyone, but those are actually tires. So someone's actually dropped some tires around those wrecks as well. <laughs> so this is someone's wreck that they've actually made themselves. Um, so going past that, we've got fish now. This is a good shot for the wreck, but it's a bit, this is a tricky one because it's got some information here that can confuse people and can also um, get you excited a lot over something not so great. So what, what's happening in this screenshot is we've got a lot of eagle rays happening here. Um, so they, they show up really well on the side scan and can get you quite excited when you see them, especially you know if you're in an area where you know you've seen true. Um, and the, the biggest thing that's um, telling me that these are eagle rays is one is the shadows are rounder shaped You'll see where your cursor is pretty much, Greg, those are quite round. They're not slim profile type shadows. Um, and especially on the bottom side, if you go down a little bit, those shadows there, you can see they're quite pronounced. Well, they're quite far away from where the actual targets are. So where that 50 foot mark is about where the fish are and the shadows sort of project back from that point. So what that's sort of saying is that they're higher up in the water column mm. because that Again, shining the torch, the further the shadow is, it's further away from the actual target. If that makes sense? Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Some great tips there, mate. So, yeah, distance of the shadow from the object is either depth, if it's something that's sitting on a stationary object that's sitting on the bottom or coming up from the bottom. If it's something that's mid-water, that's showing you the, the height above the bottom. Uh, and the shape of the shadow is telling you that it's eagle rays, not dew. So you wouldn't waste your time casting lures at that particular school of, of fish correct i mean hmm. plenty of occasions where i've you know I've still tried to cast at them anyway just hoping that they're not eagle rays but unfortunate thing with eagle rays is they like to eat lures as well and so quite often you <laughs> will hook them so yeah um, they, this time yeah. of year especially around wrecks you'll find them in morton bay um so one that's one thing i would recommend people is just try and just get a get a hang or, or, or take note of what they look like um yep. because otherwise you will waste time targeting them and chasing them down because they will run and you'll spend, you know, 10, 15 minutes trying to get your lure back from one as well. <laughs> but when you do that, though, one of the things to, to know, and this is something we hear from a lot of the guys that come on the, the uh, Sonar Masterclasses, is that if you do hook a fish, or or in this case an eagle ray, you get up to the boat, you know what it is, make a mental note of how it looked on the sounder, and then you know what an eagle ray looks like on your sounder. You're not going to waste time on, on those again. So you can you can learn as you go along. So just had a question come up from Peter Forrest, I think is uh, relevant to this particular screenshot. He's asking what the cause is of the thick line at the 15 foot mark on your sonar. Good question, because I don't have the answer to that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. I actually, it, it's sort of intermittent on my, on my new boat, so I'm not actually sure what it is. I think it's the transducers hitting the leg of the motor and it's projecting or something. So I think it's more to do with the lo location, because it always seems to be at that same same line under the boat so 
uh, nothing of interest, just my transducer install, I would say. An artifact of the setup. You've only had the boat for a short time, so you're still figuring out the, the yeah, that's right. Of the that's okay. right. So I'm just going to bring us back on the screen for a moment, mate, and yep. uh, go through a couple of questions that we've had come up. So perhaps now is a good time to go back to those early questions from Peter Forrest. I'm trying to think who else we had. Yeah. Uh, so we had Peter and we had. Bruce Fuller, both asking recommended setups for side scan. Yep. Okay. This one, pay attention very carefully. This is probably the um, probably not, I'm not. I say it's one of very common mistakes people make with this with the settings on the side scan, especially. Um, leave it on auto. It's hmm. that's all I do. I have all my units I've owned, so in the last you know eight years, it's always just been on auto because. Yep. Like the, the units will adjust based on the depth of water you're in, right? So um, for your, let me try and see if I've got the information here. For the... Um, you want to read that screenshot up again or? One sec, sorry. That's right. I accidentally opened something and it started playing. All right. <laughs> Sorry. So um, leave the settings on auto. Um, leave the frequency to, um, I prefer 455 kilohertz. So if you go back to the screenshot, it should show it there as well, the, the frequency. Um, I'll talk a bit about frequency then, I guess. Um, typically, 800 kilohertz you'd use in shallow water, 455 in deeper water. So shallow water, I would say up to, um, say, in that five to ten meter range, and then five to you know plus, you could switch to four fifty five. So you will have that overlapping range there, um, but definitely play around with the two and see which you like better. Um, sometimes the eight hundred will give you more detail, um, but you'll compromise your distance. You can scan. So if you're if you're chasing big schools of two, um, detail isn't your critical element. The de the the um, the distance is the critical element, so you want to go with that 455 kilohertz. Um, because if you see these geez, Jew, they stand out big time, so you're not going to miss them. Um, so detail is nothing really important. What you want to say, expand your your width. So the other um, setting I would say that you, the only setting I would actually play with is the um, the the range of your side scan. So that I think is quite important. That one I wouldn't leave on auto. Um, you would leave that, uh, you'd adjust that as you go. So that's something that takes a bit of experience, I guess. Um, but I guess as a general rule, what you could allow is, um, I have heard people say three times the depth you're in as you're scanning with, which will give you a rough um, a rough uh, gauge to work with. But, you know, again, it's about knowing what you're trying to look for. If you're looking for a big bommy, then go wide because you know you don't really need to see critical detail. Hmm. Um, if you're looking for you know a couple of brim, well then I would narrow my my range to say 50 or 60 feet, so maybe 20 meters, because I want that detail there, and I would drop it down to 800 kilohertz as well, yep. the yep. frequency, because it's going to help you see more detail. So that's something that will take a bit of practice, and I guess understanding what the frequency does. Um, so I guess. To the quick ways, 800 is going to give you more detail, um, and 455 is going to give you slightly less detail, but it's going to allow you to scan wider. Um, and then adjusting your range to suit is quite important. Leave the sensitivity on auto. At, at best, if you really feel like you should adjust it, just go up. You can go plus one or minus one. So sometimes I'll do that, but I'm just trying to think back the last time I actually touched the setting. It's you know, very rare that I actually change it. You know, out of the box, they come up, they work well. What about um, what about boat speed, mate? Yeah, good question. Um, with side scan, I'll probably say up to six knots is you're, you're giving yourself a good chance to see fish and show them clearly. Uh, once you start going faster, you're going to start like condensing that image. So a Jew school that might be you know so so big on your screen. It's going to condense if you go faster, so it's going to make it harder to see. So again, knowing your target, maybe going faster will be okay because you're looking for something so big, right? Whereas if you're going slower, 
it's going to allow whatever that passes through your beam, it's going to give it more time to actually show. So as your transducer is scanning, it's going slower. If it passes through a small rock or a school of brim or bass or something small, it's going to give it more chance to, to display on your screen. So slower is going to show more of it. Um, one thing to note with the speed is that if you if you pass over, let's say we're talking Jew, so you pass over a school of Jew, if you go through really slow or if you're doing your, you know, you're standing still, that school is going to look a lot bigger. The fish will look a lot longer than if you're passing through it at speed as well. So often you'll see a consistent line down the side of your screen. Um, and that's just because you're stationary. The fish potentially are stationary as well. Nothing's changing. So that, that line's not going to end until that fish passes through your sonar beam, your side scan beam. So um, knowing the, the, how the speed affects it as well, that's quite important. So if you can, looking for more detail, go slow. If you don't need the detail, then you can go a bit faster. Um, but knowing that potentially you're going to miss things. But a lot of boats as well, you know, going faster, just not an option. Side scan may mm. not read so clear. So um, every boat's going to have a different setup. I like to scan, you know, three to six knots to what I'm looking for, for two. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it varies a little bit, of course, depending on your boat and your setup. But, yeah. yeah. Got a question here from Mark Hill, uh, Nabil, about whether you're running 455 in side scan because you have a three-in-one or three, yeah, three-in-one transducer or do you have a 3D box? Yep, um, I've got a um, active imaging 3-in-1. I used to have the 3D box, but I've got the active 3-in-1, so that gives you the option to use the 800 and the side scan and the 455, sorry. Yep. Yeah, okay. All right, look, we've got lots of questions coming through, and, guys, I will try and get through all of them. If you find you put a question up and we've missed it, feel free to put it up again. Uh, it's sometimes hard because I come in thick and fast from several different Facebook pages simultaneously and from YouTube. So occasionally they slip by us. Don't feel afraid to put them up again. Question from Nick. This one's not a sonar question. It's a fishing question. He's asking, would you use live bait or soft plastics for chasing dewies um, for those people who are a little bit new to this particular aspect of fishing? Um, the way I fish probably leans itself more to using lures because I guess the style of fishing is more of a hunting style as opposed to a sitting and waiting like you're actively searching for the fish so because my boats i'm constantly sounding and looking for the schools marking them on the gps and then sort of casting in that direction or drifting through the fish you need to you know you're constantly casting winding you know the fish turn left or right, go left let's cast that way or they go the other way let's cast that way so um the lure helps um because you can get a maneuver quicker other than you know a live bait cast it out wind it in it gets messed up. You got to put a fresh one on. You'll take more time. Um, so I find mm. the lure is better because you can you can also cover more ground a lot easier as well. Mm. If the fish mm. were fussy and stationary, then I think live bait would probably be a better option. But um, for the most part, the lure, you know, if live baits work better, I, I wouldn't be against using it. I would do it, you know, because it helps me catch more fish. You know, I'm all about catching them. Um, but I think just the lure option just helps make it make you more versatile, makes it easier to get the lure in front of the fish because they will move. That's the other thing. These fish, um, especially the last few weeks I've been chasing them, they've been hard to get to because they move around a lot. So you need to be able to, you know, wind in, turn around, cast the other direction and put that lure where they've then moved to, which I think would be hard with the live bait. Yeah, yeah. And Nabil, something you mentioned when we did the podcast that um, I thought might be worth just reiterating here as well is that you'd, you said that a lot of people wouldn't enjoy going fishing for dew with you because you're going to motor around until you find fish. And if you don't find fish, you'll motor all day and then you'll pack up and go home because there's just no point stopping and fishing where there aren't any fish. So um, you want to elaborate on that or have I covered it completely? <laughs> that's, that's pretty much the case. And it's hard to explain. I actually fish a lot with my son and he's four. And it's hard to explain to him that we can't cast yet because there's, there's no <laughs> fish. <you know? laughs> um, but that's kind of what it's like. But... Uh, when you get used to it and you understand, you know, where the fish are going to be, and you know, the right times, you get confident. And you, I mean, I don't normally spend, you know, all day sounding around for nothing. You kind of work out pretty quick they're going to be there or not. And if there's no Jew in the, in the first few spots you check, well, then you change your tactics and you go in Morton Bay. We're lucky we can go chase snapper and other stuff as well. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I definitely do not cast unless I see them there. Yeah. All right. Another question we've got here. So Adam's asking, why don't we have spare screens available? Uh, so Adam Weir, 
Um, Laurence is sponsoring this series, but we're not Laurence people. So what I would suggest is either hit me up with a private message after this and I'll connect you with the Laurence guys, uh, or jump over to the Laurence Facebook page and message them direct there and um, find out what you can do about a spare screen. Um, question from Luke. Uh, any reason why the HDS 12 Gen 3 stops reading in 45 metres or more of water? Got any experience with that, Nabil? Um, could be a number of reasons, um, but I would probably be looking at the transducer first. Be checking the cables, make sure there's no damage. Um, checking the transducer itself, there's no cracks or anything. Um, and then I'd be uh, looking at where and how I mounted the transducer as well. Um, to be honest, the best thing, take some screenshots, post it up on the Laurent Simrev uh, Facebook group. I reckon that's a really good resource, especially, mm -hmm. um, you know, take some screenshots, take some photos of your install, and post it up and you know there's such a great um library of information there are plenty of people with you know more more knowledge than i have on that sort of stuff that would be more than willing to help with that situation yeah yeah lots more questions coming we'll run through a couple more and then we might jump back to a screenshot mate so yeah. another question from nick can you run a down scan and side scan simultaneously on an elite ti would you recommend upgrading to get a better view and if so which one would you upgrade to okay um, good question, because I'm actually running an Elite TI on my boat at the moment. So um, I've got a TI-9 mounted on my boat. I've got the active imaging transducer on it. So that screenshot I showed earlier where it had the three options on the top was from a HDS Live. So that's only available on the HDS Live 12 and 16 model, I think, where you can run the three separate splits on the top. Um, at the moment, because I'm running the Elite 9, I can only do two. So what I have is my... Uh, GPS on the top left, and then I have my um, sonar on the top right. You can run sonar and downscan simultaneously. Um, the thing, if I had to choose whether I wanted to see sonar or downscan, if I've already got side scan there, I'd go with sonar because side scan's kind of already showing you the downscan information already, just split and flattened out sort of across the page. Um, so, you, to answer the question, yes, you can. Um, would I recommend upgrading? Depends on your budget. So at the moment, because I'm using that that unit, I've, um, it's been a good comparison for me compared to my HDS uh, 12 Live. The the biggest note, the noticeable difference, I guess, is the screen. So the um, HDS Live is a lot clearer, it's brighter, easier to read in the sun. Um, I guess it's just you know part of the package of being a premium unit. Mm. And the Elite TI, I guess, being more mid-range, uh, more affordable, doesn't have all the glitz and glam of the live. But in saying that, using it, the sonar capabilities are just as good. Like I've caught caught my PB Jew the other week, and I had the Elite Nine on the Elite Nine on the boat, and that's what helped me find that fish. So it will definitely help you catch fish. Um, if you've got the money, I would recommend upgrading. But you're not left behind by using the TI either. Great stuff. Tell us about your PB, uh, Dewey, mate. What, what did it go? Go on, make us jealous. Uh, okay, so <laughs> this time of year is pretty good for Dew. Um, September, October, usually sort of peak time because water's warming, um, the Dew starts showing up, and the sharks aren't overly active. And so you get a good crack at them before the sharks really come in and ruin things because normally once the sharks are there, you hook one, it's sort of they'll grab it, and if they got one, they get this, they get the taste, and you won't learn another one all day. So um, I've been putting a lot of time in over the last sort of, I guess, end of August through till now, still going, trying to find these fish. And, you know, there's a wreck that I've been fishing the last couple of years. It's been producing pretty well. Um, and throughout winter, it was just dead. The whole Morton Bay was, I found, very quiet. But as soon as the water started warming up, you know, there was more bait. Started seeing more mackerel come through. It was just a lot of, um, a lot more activity. And um, I was sounding a lot of fish but not big schools, but they were big fish, big shadows, but they weren't sharks. And I, I couldn't get one to bite. I didn't really, I didn't think they were true. And, you know, every every trip I go, I check this wreck out first. And just one of the days, I cast the plastic out, working it through the fish. And the fish was sort of sitting, they were sitting up. Because like how I mentioned earlier, if the shadows are sit back, you can work out the higher in the water column. And so I just, I was using a five inch, the new dial five inch jerk shad and i just sort of slow rolled it which is weird for a jerk shad it's no action it's just plastic sort of planing and um it nailed it and 
<laughs> um, I probably like three or four cranks through and yeah, it just, it went mental. I thought it was a stingray to be honest or an eagle ray because it just went, you know, the run was crazy. I had to chase it. And then, you know, I was like almost dead set sold that it was an eagle ray. I cranked the drag up and I was trying to get it in quick and then <laughs> nearly had a heart attack when I saw it. Um, and it went 122 centimeters. Yeah, um, so it was, it was a massive PV jump for me. Um, and carrying on from the elite TI thing, like the next few Jew that I caught have all been my biggest Jew in Morton Bay, like for, for whatever reason this time of year. Um, this year, there's been some bigger fish around and, you know, I've had no trouble finding them and, you know, casting lures to them with that sounder. Good stuff. Right, mate, we've still got plenty of questions coming up, but we might just zap over. You've got a, a fair few screenshots that we can talk through, so let's just yep. mix up a little bit. Let me bring it up a bit bigger so we can see that, eh? Yep. Would you like to talk to us about what we're seeing here? Okay, so... Oh, sorry. <laughs> this one, it's, I guess, almost Morton Bay. It's just in Britain, the Brisbane River. But I wanted to show it because... Um, it's it's a school of Jew. It's a lot of Jew. Um, they're all on the right hand side on the side scan. You can sort of just see the edge of the pylons of the wharfs on the right hand side as well. Um, if you're familiar with the area, you'll probably see my screenshot of the GPS and know exactly where I am. Um, but the thing with these Jew to take note is that the shadows you can't really see them, right? So you're seeing these white grains of rice. They look like grains of rice, little white dashes on the right hand side. And the shadow is probably, you know, just on the back side of them. You can just make it out and it's giving it that sort of slight depth to it. And all that that's telling me is that these fish are really tight to the bottom. They're pretty much sitting on the mud. So I know then by seeing that, that when my, my lure choice needs to be something that's going to be tight to the bottom. And if I lift the lure, it's going to sink back down pretty quick as well. And I want to be making sure that I've got contact to the bottom the whole time because these fish are on the bottom. Normally when these fish are scored up as well, they don't really move far for a lure. So if you misplace a cast, if it's not right in front of that fish, it's not going to chase it down. So you need to make sure it's in front of the fish on its head. So knowing that these fish are tight at the bottom, that's part of the equation um, out. So now you just got to make sure that you fish a heavy lure or vibe or a heavy weighted jig head for your soft plastic that's going to sit straight on the bottom. Um, and then try and keep it in front of their faces for as long as possible. Hmm. When they're when they're tight, when, a lot of species. When we talk to gurus about using sonar, they'll say, you know, a, a common sign that they're feeding actively and that they're in an aggressive mood will be that they're up off the bottom. Is that the same with the Jew? I've had this discussion with a number of people, and in my experience, I've not found them to be feeding when they're in schools. Okay. This could be completely against what someone else thinks, but I just feel like they they feed elsewhere. They come together and they chill out, breed. I don't know what they're doing, but they're they group together. Um, and then I feel like that night time is when they'll feed or they'll split up. And they'll, in Morton Bay, they might you know hit the shallow reefs. And I've heard of them eating sweet lip and little snapper and stuff before. So that's sort of my theory at the moment. <laughs> that's the thing with these fish. There's it's hard to be certain what they do. It drives me a bit insane, to be honest. Um, but <laughs> they're not. Yeah, well, it is. It is. It makes them, you know, hard to understand, which makes you want to chase them more. The the thing is, you know, like I said, I've never really found them to be on bait and smashing bait or anything like that, or found them to be aggressive. And that's why I said they don't really move much for a lure, because I don't think they're in a the mood to eat. Hmm. So you're presenting a lure to a fish that's not really hungry. Um, they probably get frustrated enough like that. They, they eat most of the time. And I think it's because, you know, it's sort of that jelly bean theory where you, you put a jelly bean in front of someone, they're going to eat it. You give them a burger. If they've already had a meal, they're probably not going to eat it. Um, so you put in that lure, if you place it well, that's why, you know, seeing a sonar, seeing a side scan, knowing where your boat is and casting to the right spot helps put it in front of that fish's nose. But if it's not there, they're not going to get, they're not going to move to eat it. I can guarantee you that like the amount of casts, that I put and you know, seeing the school move when I've repositioned my boat and seen the size scan, like I know for a fact you've got to put it in front of them, otherwise they just will not eat it. Hmm. 
Mm. Yeah, and look, you know, there's lots of reasons why fish will take lures when they're not feeding as well, as you say. You know, you can annoy them sometimes. You can sometimes it's a reaction, but you might have yeah. scared them. You know, like yeah. the lures come through at a long time or competition or lots, lots of different reasons. Or equally, there's lots of reasons why they might not eat a lure if they're all packed and just resting up. So we've got a couple more questions have come through. So Peter Forrest's asking about the colour for side scan. Does it make much difference what colour um, it is? It can. There's definitely bad or worse colours than others. Um, I like to use that sort of yellow. There's there's a few there's a few shades of yellow and there's a blue one as well that I've used. Um, I find those best. Uh, some you'll find will give you more contrast, but um, to be honest, the the the, lot, the the sort of yellowy shades is like a I don't even know what you call it. It's like a it's not yellow, but it's not brown. It's sort of in between. Like amber, isn't it? Amber. Yeah, like sort that. of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I find that's quite good. Like I guess if you just bring up one of the screenshots, Greg, they're probably most of mine are the same color. It's that it is that yellow one. Um, but you know, I used to use the blue one for a couple of years as well. Um, I just find those better. It just gives me a bit more help see the fish and the shadows quite clearly. Because sometimes you'll find the colors like I think red, for example, it just makes it quite hard to see the actual shadow because it's quite a darker color. Um, so there's definitely you know colors that aren't great. But also, you know, some colors might show the bright return a lot better. So, like, say, the front edge of a, a reef, and maybe that's why it, when you use a, a darker color, like a red, for example. Yeah, and, I mean, we all our eyes are all slightly different. You know, we're, all, we're all unique, and so some colors may just work better for your eyes as yep. well. We're yep. in different light. Um, so just a comment from Bruce saying, and I think this was when we were talking about how to get better images yes. on your side scan. So made the comment that he's found that raising the prop up slightly makes a big image improvement. So thank you, Bruce. If you others who are listening are having issues with that, that may be something to try. Uh, question from Brenton about how far back the transducer reads from the boat. Uh, okay, got a comment so, on that one, Nabil? Yeah, so side scan, it's um, pretty much reading perpendicular to your boat. It's not scanning backwards. It's scan it's If you imagine it to be... How can I explain this best? Think of it as a thin line running from your transducer perpendicular from the boat. So it's, and as you move, it's sort of scanning across with your boat. So everything your boat passes is being touched by that line or that beam. So you're not going to see behind you. You're just going to see what's in front of you as you go past. So if something, this this is a good exercise, I guess, people I, I would recommend for people is um, on your boat with side scan on, drive past something that you know. So a good one is a bridge pylon. Mm -hmm. And just and and watch sonar, and watch the pylon, and 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 see exactly when it shows up on your screen in relation to the boat. And it's going to be when it's perpendicular to your transom, if that's where your transducer is mounted. It's going to be that at that point. So normally, when I find a school true, the moment I hit that school, I'll know exactly that they are ninety degrees out to my right or left, whichever side. Um, so I know where they are in relation to the boat, and then I can make a cast up or down depending on the current to try and get the lure to them at that point. Yep, and of course the boat's moving forward as well. So depending on how fast you're moving, yep. you know, they're, they're perpendicular when you see them. By the time you get a cast out, they may be slightly behind you. So it's not actually exactly. the, not actually the sonar here; it's the movement of the boat you've got to take into account. So yeah, question coming right. through from Nick. I was actually going to ask this one myself. So he's asking about the best times of day. Um, and, and moon phases and tides and all that kind of thing, mate. When's the when's the hot bite for dewfish in Morton Bay? If you had to put your money on it, when would you go? If I had to put my money on it, ideal scenario is, um, say, around the moon, new or full, just so with decent tide, so you want flow. I don't really hmm. care which moon it is as long as there's a bit of flow. Um, different tides will fish better on run-in and run-out, so... If I'm fishing my favorite spot, it'll be a high tide at about 7 a.m., I reckon, which gives me a couple hours of low light period before a tide change, which I think is ideal. Um, the slack tide isn't what you want. The slowing of the tide is what you want. So that's probably a key there. Um, that's why I said, like, a lot of run is good, but um, you can make it harder to target fish when there's a lot of run as well. Um, but that's why that slowing of the tide is quite important because then it will help you get your lures down to those fish. Um, and for whatever reason, like I never really thought of Jew to be a 
a low light period fish are kind of, I guess they're sitting deep. I didn't really think it to affect them. But um, I have found in the last couple of years, the early morning sort of does um, play a big part, getting getting those better schools to bite, in, especially in some of the shallower grounds. Okay. Um, but in I have caught them all hours of the day, to be honest, all moons, all tides. So sometimes you can just rock up, see a school, and, and put the lure in front of them, they'll bite. Um, but a lot of the time, I was they, they won't as well. Um, but yeah, if I had to put my money on it, Fishing around a tide change, low light period, and with good flow would be would be a, a good recipe for a good session. Cool. So a question from Beto about um, mapping, mate. So he's mentioned that Lorant seem to be moving away from Navionics and towards sea maps. Uh, which you use, mate, and why? What's your preference? Yep, um, I'm running a sea map card at the moment. It's oh, forget the model name. It's not the latest one. But um, it's it's really good. Um, I used to run avionics. You know, I think this is as good or better. There's a lot more detail with the contours and the new C map. Ah, I forget the name now. Um, the new one. It's just they released a couple of months ago. Is is even you know it's next level. The contour detail is really good. Um, so you know I like the C map stuff. The other cool thing with C maps, if you haven't seen, is that they've got an app on the phone. Um, it's called C map Embark, and it's free. You know, I paid twenty odd dollars or whatever it is for the Navionics one, but now I just use the C Map um, app. It's you know, it's got all the maps there and um, makes it makes it easy. And you know, it's free, which is good. You can sit on the couch and look at new areas and and marks and look up stuff like that. So it's it's good. The price, the price is right. Perfect, right? <laughs> okay. Often is something like that free. So we, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think they're losing out. <laughs> Don't give him any ideas, mate. All right, question <laughs> from Robert. He's saying, uh, do you find that you get a better picture going with the tide or going against it? Yep. So going with the tide means that you've got the tide helping you along. So your motor's not running as much to achieve the same sort of speed as opposed to running against the tide. So your prop spinning at less revs, creating less disturbance in the water, hmm. less noise, Less noise to the fish, less noise to your transducers. So going with the tide better, definitely. So once you found, sorry, you go. I was going to say, if if you had a spot, um, your first pass should always you should try and do it with the tide, I guess. Okay. Yep. Cool. Now once you've found fish, Nabil, and you're actually casting to them, do you then just allow the boat to drift? So your lure is drifting at the same speed as a boat, or do you continue to motor and, and hold position and or spot lock or whatever? Depends on the fish. Um, because these fish can sometimes be moving constantly, um, I guess one point that might help people understand it better is if you think about these two as a tuna school on the surface, right? When you see a tuna school, you see fish busting, you, mo you move your boat towards them, position yourself to make a cast and make a cast, right? You're not going to stop and cast when they're 200 meters away and you're drifting the other way. Um, so you, you put the time in to position your boat well, so you're casting into that bust up. And it's easy because you can see it visually, right? It's in front of you, the water's exploding, and you know where the fish are. So I feel Jew are very similar in that regard. It's just underwater, and we don't have that direct vision. So we're looking using the sonar to, to see where they are. They react similarly to tuna. If you drive on top of them, they can spook. They can move away. If you find these fish, you will have definitely have days where you cannot get on top of them. Just because they see your boat, they see the shadow, they hear the noise, they move 50 meters to the left, 50 meters to the right, and they're gone again. Yeah. Um, and that's what I found of, of late. They get spooked really easily. Um, so uh, what was your question? I've just confused myself. <laughs> but my question was when you're casting lures, are you drifting uh, yeah. with, the, with the school of fish or are you using a yeah. So like I said, yeah, so I guess it depends what they're doing. Um, mm. If it's a, if I've, just sound of the school, I'll try and position myself within casting range without having to move too much. I'll have the electric down. Um, I don't normally spot lock. Um, only time I'll spot lock is if they are stationary and not moving, and I'm definitely certain of that, and I could um, keep my lure in front of them, and that's usually on a lower, on a slower tide period as well. Um, if you spot lock with the tide running hard, you know, you're struggling to get your lure to stay on the bottom because it's sort of, you're casting up as far as you can, and your lure is drifting back, it'll probably hit the bottom when it gets past your boat and then sort of floating up again. So you're not yeah. spending much time. That's why drifting definitely. 
Um, yep. Try and keep in contact with it as you drift, stay on top of it. That yeah. will help, yeah. Cool. All right, one more quick question from Peter, and then we'll zap over to another screenshot. And Peter's just asking what line and lead you're using, mate? What line yep. class, what strength of line? Yep. Um, most of my uh, spin gear around 20 pound braid, 20 pound leader. It's pretty much going to handle most true. Like the biggest one I caught, it had it handled it no trouble at all. Um, and, you know, still sporting enough on smaller fish as well, I guess. But, um, you know, I have had it in, in the past where I've run 10 pound and been chewed through the leader by bigger fish too. So um, the other factor we have to deal with here in Morton Bay is the shark factor. So when they are thick, of you know, fish 30 pound braid, 30 pound leader on a fairly heavy bait cast setup um, and just try and get them up as quick as I can. But, you know, really you're winding, you're trying to wind faster than a shark can swim and that's not going to happen, right? So um, you give yourself a bit of a chance to, by fishing a bit heavier, but if the shark wants it, he's going to grab it. All right, mate, let's zap back over to our screenshots and see what else you've got for us. I love this one, mate. Okay. Tell us what's going on. Did you catch a fish that day? Uh, if it's the day I recall, I think we caught two, around 10. Jewish okay. was pretty good. Or, yep. Yeah. So, all right, so we're in 25-ish feet of water, which is, say, eight metres deep, um, and we've got fish on the left and we've got fish on the right. So... If you were with us from the start, you would have heard me talk about eagle rays um, and not wanting to catch one. So here we've got two options. We've got fish on the left, fish on the right. And I would be casting two of these fish on the left because those are true and the ones on the right are not. Those fish on the right are eagle rays. So the way I can tell, firstly, the Jew, you can sort of see it's a bit faint there, but... Um, trying to point on the screen, but the, the shadows behind the fish are, I guess, longer and thinner sort of shape, right? Uh, the shadows on the fish on the right are round, more ball sort of shaped. They're, they're, they're the eagle rays. So the, the shadows is what's telling me what the fish are. So by understanding what the shadows look like, I'll save myself potential 10 minutes of fighting of a, an eagle ray mm -hmm while the school of Jews swim past and go, you know, unharmed. So um, that's a school of Jew on the left. It's probably not the best shot of the fish themselves, but I guess a good example of understanding the shadows um, and to, to sort of know the difference between the two or, or different types of fish you'll encounter in Morton Bay. Um, Let's jump to the next screenshot, mate, while we're, right. while we're on a roll. Oops, we've gone past. There we go. All right. Okay. So this is them again. Um, and... The shadows here look all sorts of shaped, right? So you got at the start of that screenshot, they look quite small and narrow. They get bigger and bigger and wider and they get further away. Um, so we've got a lot of Jew here. So the first thing I can, that, that helped me tell is that these shadows, because they're long, they're sort of up and down long. There's no width to them. It's not running. They're not round like a snapper or, a, or, the, or the sting, the eagle ray, sorry. Um, the other thing that's happening here is if you look at my GPS screen, you'll see I've been going, if you follow that line, if you can see it clear, I've been going up sort of in that northwest direction and then the cursor sort of kicked more west, right? And so as that's happened, you can see on my side scan, those fish have started to be further away from me. So what's actually happened is because I've turned the boat to the left, my side scan is kicking out mm. to, to the right more. So yep. on the, to the right, and so those fish are now appearing further away. And what it's also done is because it's as I'm turning, it's distorted the image, and you can see at the top there, those shadows are now starting to look a lot bigger and rounder, right? Compared to when I was doing a straight pass, they're a bit more narrow. So the position of your boat when you sound past the fish can be quite um, can sort of dictate what you're seeing. So if you're if you're doing a circle, a wide arc or something, and you hit those schools, they're going to look different than if you were to do a straight line. So you can confuse yourself sometimes, like I do it quite often, uh, and the fish, the school may look tiny if you sort of hit it on, a, on an arc and then you go past it to a straight line and it's actually a massive school, you know, a big fish, which you may have thought wasn't something worth stopping by for. So um, just the, the way the transducer sits and how it hits those fish will, will you know, change the way um, you see it on the screen. 
Hmm. But um, yeah, it was a good school. Drew, they were hungry. They were all around a meter, and it was good times. <laughs> so, sounds terrible. Yeah. Now, we've got a question coming through from Simon. He's asking about bait fishing for Jew. So um, Simon's down in Victoria, and he's trying to figure out whether he should use circle hooks. He's also trying to figure out whether he uh, you know, should be using bait runner reels and allowing the fish to run before he strikes. So, mate, your experience with bait fishing for Jews, how would you go about it? Um, I have done a little bit of bait fishing for Jew in the Brisbane River. Um, we use circle hooks. Um, we didn't use bait runners, but we just fished light drags and let them run and then sort of tightened up on them like you would, I guess, supposed to fish a circle hook mm -hmm. and not sort of don't strike just sort of ease into it um and i guess i'd suggest the same thing i have heard people i've heard theories in the past you know of surf fishermen always letting the tailor other jew take their first run with an lv kind of with minimal tension so they get the bait down um but then lure fishing i just set it as hard as i can as soon as i feel the bite as well so um i don't know about that theory um i would just say i guess if you're bait fishing, maybe gave the fish a bit more time. So circle hook situation, you probably want to, you know, let it take some and then sort of ease on, ease into it, t tighten the drag back up or engage the bait runner. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Quick question from Justin about hook sizes uh, and plastic sizes for targeting Jew yep. and also uh, vibes. And mate, uh, I should mention here actually that we did have a pretty good chat about this on the ALF podcast a while back and you went through your lure selections, hook sizes, and, and how to go about fishing into those lures. So, folks, if you want to zap over to doclures.com and just type the beal into the search bar, you'll find that episode and you'll get a lot more information. But let's give a, a quick rundown here and now so that everybody mm -hmm. gets the benefit of your experience, mate. Yep. Okay. So, um, jig heads, I'm fishing 5 0 hooks most of the time. Um, if I want to fish a smaller plastic, obviously I'll go a smaller hook, but I'll try and keep it on the larger side just so I've got a bit more gape and a bit more strength in the hook itself. Um, with the plastic size, I'm fishing mostly four to five inch. So four inch grubs, five inch jerk shads. Uh, and for vibes, most of the time I use a, I think it's a 95 mil fish trap or 90, whatever the size is. Uh, it's around 20 grams. Um, and yeah, the stocks, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, and hooks. I don't even, don't even think I've ever changed the hooks, but the stock standard trebles on them are good. Um, but yeah, generally bigger hook size with the, with the soft plastics. Um, so five O on a five inch jerk shad. Sometimes even a six O I have used, um, and even the five O on the four inch grubs. Um, it doesn't look pretty, but um, I just I feel like that extra hook cape helps to keep them in. Yeah. Cool. Here with me a second, folks, as I try and juggle a couple of things at once here. Let's bring up another question. So um, oh, there are no other questions. Let's bring up with the screenshot, mate. Okay. What do you got? What's next? Well, that's what you've got, mate. Let's have a look and see what you've got here for us. If I can get the, uh, get the mouse to work. Here we go. No, that's not going to help, is it? I'm not seeing How, it. How's that? All right. So this is um, so one of my, my favorite spots in Watton Bay is West Peel Artificial Reef. It's no secret spot. Um, it's heavily written about, it's publicized, it's on the government website, you can get the marks. But um, they've actually dropped one of these giant cube things, I think they call it a fish box, on the southern end of the reef. And um, it holds a lot of juice. It's a great spot for targeting Jew. Um, and I would, you know, anyone in Southeast Queensland, if you haven't heard of it, it's probably something worth having a look at. Um, that fish box is four meters high by four meters wide, four meters long, four meter cube. It's quite big. And um, one thing that's important with, with um, finding spots for Jew, if you want to look for your own spots or look for new spots, um, is searching for something big. So this is what I tell people is find something that's big, something that if you want to find a school of 50 Jew, look for a spot that can 50 Jew can hide in. Like think of it like that because these fish, they're, you know, they're big and they're probably bigger than most of the other fish around the area, but they're also not the apex predator. So they, you know, they will feel the need for shelter. And so they want somewhere where if something goes wrong, they can, 
hide in, get shelter, get out of the, you know, out of the main view of, of the sharks or whatever else it is that's coming for them, the boats mostly probably. Um, so that's that's the structure. There's a screenshot that goes with that, Greg, one of the blue ones, if you pop it up. Yeah, so that's what it looks like on the side scan. So you can sort of see, um, if you probably bring that up, yep, full screen. You can see the shadow. The shadow is actually telling us a lot more than the white return line there. So you can sort of see the white shape forming the cube, um, but the shadow behind us is giving a lot better definition of what the of the shape of it. So as we've passed it, it's shown up on our left hand side. If just sort of behind the the box, you'll see these little round things. Those are also part of the artificial reef. They're like reef balls. They're just like these giant landmine looking things that they've dropped all around the, the reef. Those they, ones there, mate, or these that's ones? That's them, all of them. Yep, just a like big that. round ball, yep. like giant golf balls, really, I think they look like. Um, and that they're good structure, but they don't hold you. Um, the Jew hold around the big structure that they can actually get into that's going to, you know, cause a diversion in the current. It's going to be a place where, you know, there's different water flows, bait fish may congregate, um, more is happening, you know, it's more of a party there than it is on top of a reef ball. So that's where the Jew is going to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep, cool. All right. Now, guys, for those who are asking about lures and techniques, I've just put up a link. You'll see it in the chat there to the podcast episode that Nabil did a while back on Morton Bay Jewfish. So tons more information in there. You can go over and check that out afterwards. Don't do it now. You've got to stay on, online now and talk to us. But at the end of this, of course, that uh, link will still be there. So make sure you go and check it out. Um, Bruce is asking a question, mate, about your favourite plastics. Um, I guess if you listen to the podcast, I would have said one thing. Um, and <laughs> now six months later, I'll tell you a different one. <laughs> <laughs> um, it really does change, I guess. Um, I, I, I think that the fish get used to certain laws or techniques and they, they get onto something and become more clued onto it. Um, so I generally change things most seasons. I find one year, you know, micro jigs were my go to one year, uh, soft fives and one year, um, the Koga ball style jig that I brought out last year worked really well um but the last i guess few months that i've been fishing for i've just been fishing the new um bait junkie soft plastics that daiwa, daiwa brought out hmm. and they've been really good i like them because they've got a different scent on them that's kind of new the fish wouldn't have smelt um the profiles aren't anything you know game changing or anything it's like a i'm just fishing a generic five inch jerk shad um but it's you know i've caught the last three fish have been my three biggest Jew I've ever caught in Morton Bay. And that's out of, you know, I'd say a couple of hundred. So something sort of worked well with them. Um, so I'll stick with them. The baby bass color, I would say definitely go with that one. If you're going to pick one, it's a good color. Okay, cool. Let's go back to screenshots, mate. Yep. Yes, this one. So this is an old, older screenshot. This is from one of the first years I've sort of started sounding these fish is with the Lorentz HDS Gen 2 Touch, that's the first touch screen model they brought out. It's probably the a lot of, the one a lot of people got into using with side scan. Um, this is a big school of true. Mm. This is, I would say, 100 plus true, all schooled up, all um, easily targetable. The thing when you find schools this big is it's it's really hard to not place a lure in front of one Jew. Um, so, you know, all I need to do at that point is I know they're on the left-hand side. It's just lob a cast, you know, five meters <laughs> left-hand side of the boat, get to the bottom and, and hang on. So with this with these Jew, what you're looking for is just these little grains of rice, these little wiggly lines. It's I guess it's it's that's what it is. That's what the fish look like. And so when there's... Hundreds of them together it just looks like spaghetti or noodles, really. Um, it's just a big cluster of, of wiggly lines, squiggles, um, and that's what they, they will look like on your side scan. So that's that's what you're looking for. It doesn't look like a perfect image of a true. You know, you won't always see that nice, clean, separate fish with a clean shadow. It's going to be a muddled mess because they're going to be together. They're going to be stacked up. They're going to be, you know, in a ball sometimes, like... If you ever watched any underwater footage of Jew and how they move in schools, you know, they're not necessarily all flat to the bottom. Sometimes they're schooled up 10 fish high as well, um, moving like a ball. 
Mm. So um, it, you, you'll see them. They'll be easy to see. Uh, you're definitely not going to miss them, but they're not going to be a clean, pretty picture. It's going to be chaos on the screen. And that's, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for this mess on your sonar that's going to take up half your screen. And that's that's the stuff you want to see that's going to bring you, you know, the days you remember when you're fishing. Good stuff. All right, let's have another look at another screenshot. Yeah. So this school, this school really frustrated me. So these fish, they must have been in, in a breeding mode or just not feeding, but they were sort of balled up in this tornado sort of shape um, in an area that I don't normally target them, but we did see them there and we thought we'd spend some time sitting on them because, you know, if you see fish like that, you think, all right, we've got to wait till they bite because it's going to be it's going to be on when they, when they do turn on. But I think in four or five hours, we didn't get a fish to bite. So I, th I kind of think that in that instance, when they're sort of in that mode, balling up, they were breeding or doing something that was where feeding was the last thought in their mind. So, you know, from experience now, I've learned if I see them like that, which I have a couple of times, is they're going to be hard to tempt. Um, but, you know, that's, that's kind of a good example of what the fish look like on different angles as well. Hmm. You can sort of see there, in a round a shape. Running, was there a current running through at that time, mate? It's a, uh, doesn't get a great deal of current at that spot. Um, and to be honest, I can't remember which way the current would have been in relation to that screenshot. Now, the reason I ask is that, you know, it's uh, a lot of people assume that fish don't sleep, but fish actually do sleep. And I suspect I quite often hear people talking about how, you know, they've been fishing for dewies and, and the tide changes or they get to slack tide and the fish all move to the deeper water near a bridge pile or whatever. And, and then they sit there and they can't tempt them. And I suspect they're actually sleeping. And I just wondered, this is a place where there's not much current flow or it's, you know, around that. Yeah, it's not. They might have been resting up and, and sleeping. Yeah. And it's a spot that's notorious for having these hard to catch fish. So, yep. um, not a yeah. it's it's kind of a junction spot, not a lot of current. So you're right; they could be sleeping. It's a good point. Yeah. Cool. What's happening here, mate? Okay, so this is a uh, school of Jew, but caught in deeper water or found in deeper water. So this is eighty to ninety feet. This is actually offshore, off the Gold Coast. Um, but I wanted to show that, you know, you could still find them in the same sort of uh, congregations as you would in Morton Bay or in the Brisbane River or in an estuary offshore. So big school of fish. These are much bigger class of fish. And they, they behave a little bit different where they sit up a bit higher in the water column as well. So these fish you can see on the sonar and downscale and they're starting to come on screen. They're sort of sitting. They look really tight to the bottom, but they're still 10 to 15 feet off the bottom, you know, which is still quite a high amount, mm. you know, um, off the bottom. So, um, again, this, this will help me, you know, pick my lure choice and know that, you know, if I'm hopping a vibe on the bottom, it's doing nothing because it's lifting two to three foot off the bottom. It's not going to be in front of these fish. Um, whereas in this instance, I need to be working something up. So hopping my plastic up, you know, five, six meters off the bottom and then let it sink back down through them. And they do the same thing. Um, that's why I guess knowing where they are in the water column is quite important. Um, this reef in particular is very similar to that shot we, the photo we showed before with that fish cube. They've actually got a lot of those cubes, a lot more uh, in the same sort of reef. Um, and it's just that kind of structure that, like, they must love, you know, that sort of structure that they can get into because they, you know, frequent this area. And so on the side scan in deeper water, so there's a question that's come up that says, what's the maximum depth you use side scan? Um, this is probably the deepest I've found schools of Jew, so 80 to 90 feet, so let's say 30 meters. Um, and the thing with this depth is you'll want to increase your uh, range if you start getting into these depths with side scan. Like we said at the start, um, your range can be proportionate to your depth. So a general rule of thumb is three times your depth. Um, so in this instance, we're in 30 meters of water. I've gone to 200 feet. Um, I've gone to 250 feet before. I've done 300 feet before. And, you know, I am uh, probably could have gone wider, to be honest, in this in this screenshot, just to cover more ground to see these fish. Um, so uh, the maximum depth I've used it successfully to target Drew is this depth in the screenshot, but I have used it deeper in 
I guess, 120 foot for snapper as well. Okay. Now, when you saw these fish on your screen, mate, did you know that they were due? From experience, I knew they were, just because okay. the way so they were from the, Not cool. from the sonar, but because of where you were fishing and what you caught there before, you correct a fairly good idea. That's what they were. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yep. Cool. All right. What else have you got? We must be getting towards the end of your slide deck. That's it, mate. We, okay. We're done and dusted as far as the slides go, unless there are some that we've... Let me go back up. Okay, so there have right. been a few more. It's not going to let me go back up. Let me just go for a PowerPoint from the start. Eh? We might have started partway through the slide deck, perhaps. Yeah, we did. The one of the ones I wanted to show was just actually a school of snapper, but I just want to show the difference between what snapper look like and what Jew look like. Let me just. If you scroll through. Oh, yeah, you tell me when done. Yeah, this one. Yeah. Uh, actually, go to the next. I think might be the next one. Don't know if I get it. Yeah, okay. That's better. So, this is a school of, um, of snapper in Morton Bay. I won't go into too much detail about them, but the, the big difference here is that you can sort of see there's more roundness to the fish. Mm. I don't know if you, it's, it's maybe if you can see it on the screen. Um, but that's sort of what's the telling thing for me that these are snapper and not true. A couple of them are bigger lines. They're probably bigger fish, but there's also a lot of real small circles almost in that amongst, amongst that mix of fish. Um, and that's what's telling for me that these aren't, um, these aren't true, they're snapper. Yep. So yep. in Morton Bay, I think it's just the reason I want to show it is just because you will see other different species. You'll come across different things. You'll come across sharks, schools of sharks, eagle rays, um, snapper. Normally, if you see snapper like that, you'd be really happy. But these fish were in again either sleeping or spawning mode or something because they didn't want to touch anything. <laughs> Fair play. Yeah, um, you know, you'll you'll see a lot of different a lot of different fish. And knowing what they are can help you, you know, with your lure selection, with how to target them, where to position your boat. You know, you know, it's a, if it's a snapper and if they're feeding, most of the time they will move for a lure. So you can just cast in the vicinity and they'll come up for it. Um, if you know it's a Jew, you know that's not going to happen. So you want to fish a heavy lure, it's going to go straight to the bottom. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions there, ever used jigs for Jew that are off the bottom? So those fish in that previous screenshot where they were sitting up off the bottom, the only way I caught them was with jigs. So I was fishing. Um, I was fishing, uh, fishing a micro jig or whatever you want to call it. It was a 65 or 70 gram jig and pretty much cast it out, let it sink to the bottom, hopped it up about, just trying to think, would probably have hopped it up a few cranks with the handle, got it up a few meters, and then back down and did the same thing because I knew those fish were you know up off the bottom a bit so you want to be fishing that part of the column more than the actual seabed um, and jigs will be good because you can actually do that quite efficiently quite quick and if you got a slow four one as well you get that hang time in front of those fish it does help yep so a question from Jim as well about what the structure is on that uh yep. here, what the structure is on that particular screenshot yep so this screenshot showing just it's it pretty much just sand what it is those um are basically the um what's the word for it but we know where the sand sort of gone up and down with the current movements um there is a, a big rock bar that's just out of screenshot there that, that that was you know holding the fish but what we're looking at here is just sand yeah it's a good uh, thing if you're looking for uh, sometimes brim um, a few other species all sort of like this sort of structure um, those sand undulations, that's the word, um, can, you know, be current breaks for fish as well. So they can sit on mm. the downward side and get out of the current. So brim will do that quite often, especially when they're spawning around the, the river mouths. Uh, you find sort of those undulations with current and bait around, it's probably going to be brim around them too. Yeah, if you haven't fished the Morton Bay area before, folks, go and have a look on Google Earth and you'll see there's acres and acres and acres <laughs> of that kind of um, undulating sandy bottom. So, uh, Right, mate, let's see what else you've got in the screenshot department here. Yep, that's the same. That's just, just the same sort of snapper one. So you can see again, 
very round in profile, not the long lines that we were looking for previously for the true. They're sort of balled up. Um, just telling for me that those are snap out, they're not true. How much is that affected by boat speed, mate? If you were moving faster, would those shapes be more along? Yeah, so look at the bottom of the screen. Yep. You've got to see, I think we got to slow down or started at, started motoring, and those fish look longer. Yep. Um, if I um, sat still when I got on top of or, or adjacent to those um, that school of snapper, it would have just been a flat line of fish if they stood still and probably would have looked like you. Um, yep. And I, you know, could easily mistake that for you as well. Yeah. So you do have to take into account your boat speed as well yes. as, you, as you're trying to decipher this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Those sleeping tornado schools of true. That's them again. Um, but this time with some sharks to keep them at bay as well. Um, this instance, they, it was a weird one because they, they sort of came into this formation after schooling up, but they were still eating lures, which um, which I found a bit odd. Another thing you can tell with this one, I've got the um, frequencies up to 800. Mm. And so that's actually providing quite crisp detail on that shark. You can see the, the shadow quite nicely, so you're getting more detail. Um, but the, the side scan would uh, deteriorate if I went wider than that. Yeah, so it's actually a question that Justin had asked as well about your sonar frequencies. Yep. Yeah, majority of the time I run 455. Um, this depth in this instance, I think it was sort of 25 to 30 foot, which is like borderline going to 800 or 455. So, you know, if I went either one, I wouldn't be disappointed with the, the image that I was seeing. Sure, sure. Another comment there about noise on the sonar. I'm not sure if he was referring to this one or the previous one. Probably the previous one. Yeah, I'd run my um, sensitivity on the sonar screen a bit higher. Um, just because I, I'd like to see more. I can generally tell what's interference or what's, you know, stuff in the water compared to fish. Um, I'd rather see more than see less and miss out on a detail that I that wasn't otherwise there. We'll be back to where we started. Yeah, I think we're we'll back start. to where we started, mate. Yeah. So that must be all of the screenshots. So I'm gonna ditch the ditch the screenshots. And uh and that's about it, mate. So, folks, I'm going to just um, keep Nabil here for just a few minutes longer. He's been very generous with his time. But uh, if you do have any questions uh, or if I've missed any of the questions, I I've been back through a couple of times. I think I've gotten pretty much all of them. But if you, if you have a last-minute question, guys, we'll just stick around for a couple more minutes and Nabil will be happy to answer you. Otherwise, we might just wish him a good night, let him go off and have a quiet beer and uh, celebrate a job well done. I am. Um... Yeah, if anyone's got any questions, fire them through. But I guess the thing with these fish and the biggest tip I can give you guys is if, you, if you're really serious about catching them, it's just to go out there and there's no real secret spots. Like I've given out a pretty generic spot that's probably one of the best areas for uh, jewies in Morton Bay. Um, you just got to put the time in and, and learn how to read the sounder. Like I was saying before, you know, go and side scan past a bridge pylon. That's you know that helped me a, a, a lot. You know, um, if you're if you're kind of on the fence about side scan, whether it works or it hasn't worked for you, um, it won't work for you until you see a fish, cast at that fish, and catch it, and it'll be like a you know mind blown moment. Light because, bulb moment. Yep. You know, everything will just come into place at that point in time. You think, all right, I saw that school. I know what that looks like now. That's true. That's yeah. snapper. That's whatever it was. Um, and I'm confident that. If I see that again, I can replicate that, or I know where I can see that again, or I know where I can replicate that in other spots. And you know, it's you'll get more confident, you'll get better at it, and yep. it, it will help you catch more fish. You just got to put the time in. It's there's no real silver bullet. You just got to get out there and practice. I'm on the water. Okay, yep. uh, a couple of last minute questions. So, a uh, question about what color vibes you like? Um, natural colors, definitely. Um, I'm terrible with the names of the vibes that I use. Uh, there's an AU looking one, so it's like a greeny clear color one. Um, and there's another one, it's sort of gold with stripes, it's got a bit orange. <laughs> this is probably no help, but natural made <laughs> fish king. Uh, the ones with the shrimp sort of profile, look, shrimp sort of look too, they're good. Um, these are all the fish trap 
Yeah, that's the fish trap ones. Yeah, go have a look at the um, Wilson's fishing website at the fish traps and. Um, that's and right. I, I'm pretty sure I've caught them on most of the natural colours. I don't think one's better than the other. You just want to throw something that looks like a fish they would actually eat is how how I picture it. Um, that's sort of why, like I was saying before, the baby bass um, jerk shad, just because most of the bait fish in Morton Bay are that sort of green top, clear bottom look. You know, that's just what they look like. Hmm. It looks like their normal food source. Yep. All right. A question from Justin about fish reveal or not on the down scan. Um, I don't use it um, myself, but I can see it being a benefit. Um, essentially, it's it's overlaying sonar on top of down scan. I most of the time run the sonar and so, uh, down scan screens on my um, display anyway, so I'm seeing both information. I like to have them separate because I'm getting the most information I can get. I feel if you're sometimes you're condensing it by putting them overlaying on top of each other. Um, what Fish Reveal does well is it helps you understand an arch where it's a fish on down scan, if that makes sense. Sometimes you'll see an arch on your sonar and your down scan might show a little grain of rice and that helps you put that connection that that's what that arch is representing. And so now on down scan, I'm not looking for arches, I'm looking for little grains of rice. That makes sense. Um, it's not, uh, it's it's a good tool to help you uh, get more understanding of the of the sonar, but it's not a, it's not gonna change things or it's not amazing, you know, breakthrough or anything not like that. Danger. No, but it, it will help, especially if you're new to it or you, if you're struggling to grasp the concept of downscan for Sono, that's where it's really going to come into its own. Okay, cool. All right, Nabil, we're going to let you go, mate. It's been absolutely brilliant talking to you. Thanks so much for coming along. and thanks That's for all right. Thanks for having me. It's been good. I like talking. I like talking fishing, so it's all good. <laughs> well, it's, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, mate. You're always a wealth of knowledge, and I learn something every time we have a chat. So tonight has been no exception. So thanks once again. Thanks also to Navico and to our ants for sponsoring these masterclasses. It's fantastic to get some great anglers on board and be able to flesh out how to use sonar better. Even if you're not using a Laurent sounder, a lot of the information that we got tonight applies no matter what sonar unit you're using. So um, great to get that. We really appreciate their support on these masterclasses. I'm not sure who we've got coming up next fortnight, but we will have another masterclass. It'll be a Simred uh, angler more than likely. Um, this time next week, Monday uh, at 8 o'clock, for the New South Wales Victorian viewers and at seven o'clock for the Queensland viewers. So thanks again, uh, Nabil. Thank you everybody for coming along. Thank you for some great questions and for sticking with us right through to the end. We've had a pretty good turnout tonight. It's been, uh, been great. So thanks guys. It's good. Thanks for all the kind comments as well, guys that are posting now. Um, it's good. I enjoyed it. If you have any other questions, feel free to message me directly as well. I'm more than happy to help. Yeah, terrific stuff. All right. Thanks Nabil.